Hi, everyone, and welcome to this special Black History Month conference hosted by MS Focus, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, made possible with support from Biogen, EMD Serrano, Genentech, and Bristol Myers Squibb. I am your host, Kimani Hendricks, Multimedia Communications Coordinator for MS Focus, and today our speaker is Dr. Annette Kai whose topic is addressing bias in healthcare. After the presentation, we will leave it open for your questions and comments. Annette F. Okai, MD, is the founder and medical director of the Multiple Sclerosis Treatment Center of Dallas at Baylor University Medical Center. She's also an assistant clinical professor at Texas Tech University Health Science Center. Dr. Okai is a diplomat of the American Board of Physiatry and Neurology. She has participated in several clinical trials and is currently conducting multiple trials at her treatment center in Dallas. Her professional activities include serving as a member of the Clinical Advisory Committee for the National MS Society and the North Texas Leadership Council. She also serves on the Medical Advisory Board for the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. Dr. Okai manages all stages of MS and her care philosophy includes a multidisciplinary approach to patient management, and we're pleased to have her join us to present this important topic. Dr. Okai, thank you for being with us today. I'm gonna to turn it over to you as soon as I stop sharing my screen. <laughs> thank you to the MS Foundation for inviting me and allowing me to present today. Um, I am thrilled to be talking about this topic that is near and dear to my heart, and I'm sure to everyone here as well, uh, due to the fact that you walk on. So thanks for spending the afternoon with us. Compared to Caucasian counterparts, uh, African Americans and Hispanics present at a younger age. So the age range, average age, and, and, and when you read the literature, the age of diagnosis is between 20 to 50, but of the average age of a Caucasian a person diagnosed with MS is about 40, whereas for African Americans is about 38 and Hispanics 36. Uh, people of color also present uh, with uh, differently compared to Caucasians as well. African Americans are present with multi-symptom onset. So it's not only the eye that is affected, but also and perhaps the uh, uh, walking or balance or uh, numbness or tingling all at once. Hispanics, on the other hand, usually present with optic neuritis. The area of the central nervous system that is most likely affected in these two populations are the spine and the optic nerve. And why is that important? Because the spine usually control the movement of the extremities. So walking is affected, dexterity is affected, bowel and bladder symptoms are affected. And if your optic nerve is, is affected, you also have difficulty seeing and some people become legally blind. And these areas are areas that can lead to early disability and higher level of disability as you see on the screen. Another difference that we notice between the Caucasians and people of color is that the disease progression is very rapid. So um, African-Americans tend to use the cane six years earlier compared to their Caucasian counterpart. And Hispanics also developed a disability earlier compared to that group as well. They also tend to have lower vitamin D levels. And with lower vitamin D levels, we know that is one of the risk factors for MS and the type of relapses that uh, uh, patients have. So all of these differences have been observed over time. And this uh, has led us to say, could this be something, uh, a different variant of the disease in this population? But we do not have the answer to that right now. Talking about healthcare disparities and addressing certain uh, health inequities in this population, what has been seen is that African and his, African Americans and Hispanics 
are less likely to uh, seek care from an MS specialist. Now, why is this important? MS is a very complicated disease. MS affects almost all parts of the body and requires comprehensive care. And the specialists usually are the ones that are providing the comprehensive care to treat the disease. But that is not what we see in this population. They're likely to see the primary care doctor or a general neurologist. And there are various reasons for that, uh, primarily economic factors. So lack of insurance plays a huge part in, how, in uh, access to care and also the time commitment. So with the African-Americans and Hispanic populations, they tend to be uh, working hourly jobs, not salary, and taking time off, going to the doctor and spending hours at the doctor may not be economically feasible for them. So that has been postulated as a reason why this occur. And more studies need to be done. Another reason why we think that uh, uh, there is bias in the healthcare system compared to uh, the Caucasian population is that lack of knowledge. You know, people uh, don't get the information about the disease process, how it affects them. They don't have information on the resources that they can use to actually control and manage the disease. And it all goes back to if you're seeking care from a specialist or from a comprehensive MS center, you have access to some of this information that the general neurologist or the primary care doctor does not have or may not provide or may not have the time to provide. Another issue may be cultural and it has been spoken to and has come to life way to the forefront of things now that COVID and, and uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, all of that has come into play. It has really opened up that access to care the mistrust of the uh, healthcare system is a huge issue because historically uh, the African American populations have been affected disproportionately and wrongly treated with the healthcare system over time. So it's not uh, surprising that there will be mistrust and that in the culture, uh, people may not seek the care that they need because of this. Once again, this is just a slide and this was found, uh, so there was a registry and a study done to say how often do African-Americans see an MS specialist or a neurologist with MS experience or a neurologist at all. And it was very eye-opening because African-Americans sometimes may not even seek care for their disease. Hispanics, what was found in the same study, were less likely to receive supportive or rehabilitative services. So we're talking about a population who has a rapid uh, uh, disease progression, who has higher disability, and access to care has been a problem. Why, why aren't Hispanics receiving occupational therapy or physical therapy? Why doesn't this group know about, you know, copay pr uh, uh, programs to, us, to help with drugs when insurance have been a problem in, uh, in the past? So that has come to light as a bias and inequity in the care of people of color with MS. The uh, one consortium also look at, okay, let's look at uh, social determinants of health and see what else could be contributing. They found out that African-Americans were more likely to be on Medicaid. Now, why is this? There are several reasons for that. If you have a disease pro uh, process that is early onset, 
you are having multiple symptoms at the same time and you are progressing to disability way earlier on, you are going to be on assistance because you don't have access, you're unable to work, you're on disability. So you're going to need Medicaid and Medicare. So that's one reason why uh, African-Americans are more likely to be on Medicaid or Medicare. And then what they found out that Medicaid patients had a higher rate of uh, emergency room visits and inpatient admissions. What was postulated but cannot be proven is it okay if someone is on Medicaid, are they getting the health that they need, the, the uh, health care that they need from an MS specialist, from a comprehensive MS center? from a neurologist or from their primary care doctor. Because if that's not the case, and most people, uh, 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 I've seen it, it's so difficult to find a provider who will take some of these insurances that patients are then left with uh, uh, their primary care provider to, to take care of the MS or prescribed their medication. And then that lands them in the emergency room for all the other uh, effects of the disease over time. So all of these need to be explored, but these findings have been observed in this population and need to be addressed as well. So how do we improve health equities with inpatient with MS? Um, first, there has to be education. Education about the disease process for both the patient and the provider. So the patient has to know that this uh, disease process, MS, can lead to disability if not treated properly. MS can affect the quality of life and disease modifying therapy is important to control that disease over time. The provider has to be educated that when it comes to people of color, they have a more progressive disease process. They have to be treated with highly effective therapy. And you have to look at all the aspects of the lives that MS is affecting in order to treat the disease itself. Social determinants of health, including access to care, transportation time also has to be taken into consideration when these patients are being treated. So the education has to be done for both people taking care of this population, the provider and the patient. And that will help improve, we hope, the, the inequities that we see over time. Another thing that can help improve that is the treatments have to be targeted towards this population. All right, so we know that uh, we have established that the disease is rapidly progressive in this population. It causes higher level of disability. So we need to treat differently. Instead of the standard, let's start with this and move on if something occurs, we need to bring our highly effective therapy early on in the treatment course to this population. We cannot wait until something happens and we cannot repair that for us to do that process. We also have to improve access to care. We have to allow and uh, educate patients about who they need to see. In, uh, in, in treating and controlling the disease. I just mentioned that it affects all aspects of someone's life. So it's not only about seeing the neurologist. We have to improve access to care for, the, uh, for these patients to the physical therapist, to the ophthalmologist, to the, neuro, uh, to the um, urologist for bowel and bladder symptoms, and then also to mental health providers like psychiatry because depression is a comorbid factor associated with MS. So it's not about just prescribing medication, it's providing access to all the different specialties that are involved 
in controlling this disease process. The, another thing to help improve equ inequities is information. All come back to education on the financial and support services that are available. So this is a group that we know go early to disability and then need to be on Medicaid and Med Medicaid and Medicare. But even if they aren't, there are some people who are underinsured and we have programs out there that assist with drug co-pay assistance for these patients. Even the uh, makers of the drugs have uh, these available. But if the patients do not know about it, they leave the doctor's office and all they know is that they have this high copay, and then they don't take the medication because of that. And that affects the disease process as well. Well, what about the support services that are offered, that the MS Foundation offers, that the MSAA offers, or the educational program, you know, the, uh, the assisting grants for modifying the home and everything else that they could benefit from? If they're not aware of that, it affects how the disease impacts the quality of life associated with this population. So it's important that we educate, we inform, we target to treat, and we improve access to care for this population. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about clinical trials. Why is it we're talking about clinical trials? I have just laid down the foundation that MS is being diagnosed at a higher rate in people of color, and also that these people progress early to disability. So we need to study drugs in this population that will be effect, that, that is being affected. And we need to study the effectiveness of these drugs. So currently in our current clinical trials, and, and this isn't uh, unique to MS. It is unique, ac it's across the board. So hypertension, diabetes, AIDS, breast cancer. We know that people of color, especially African-Americans and Hispanics who are the two largest minority group in this country, they are underrepresented in clinical trials. So when you combine the 23% uh, of the population that uh, is African Americans and over 30% Hispanic. And in the coming years, that number is going to increase. Less than 10% are participating in clinical trials. And you see, for African Americans, when you look at any trial on any given day, it's about 5%. And for Hispanics, it's about 8%. Now, how uh, with this small number, it makes it very difficult for us to assess how e efficacious the drug is in this population. So when someone comes to my office and I'm talking about drug and I say, well, in the trials, we had 60 to 70% of patients who did not show any progression. That is not very accurate when I'm talking to someone uh, who is Hispanic or African Americans because the numbers were so small in the trials, we cannot generalize that they will have that same impact. When you look at the literature pu uh, published on MS 60,000 over the past 10 years, less than 1% of the publications on MS was targeted towards um, African American and Hispanics. So this is something that needs to be corrected. This is something that needs to be addressed. Clinical trials are important because first we need to understand the disease process. So I just I mentioned earlier on that you know they present differently and they progress differently. From, the Caucasian kind of, uh, from their Caucasian counterpart. So with this progression and everything looking different in people of color versus Caucasian, what disease are we treating? So if we do not have that information, we go on treating like we always do and we are not improving efficacy for drugs. 
Then we also look at the drug that's being tested. If only three person out of 400 is being, is black or two out of 400 is Hispanic in the clinical trial, and all, how do we know the drug is effective? And we're saying that people progress differently. So we need more participants actually is what I'm trying to say in clinical trials to help us understand the disease, to help us assess how efficacious the disease is in this population. And if what we are prescribing really is the right thing for our patients, uh, most especially the African-American and the Hispanics population. So to answer those questions, we need to increase recruitment. And the questions that are very important is, is this a different disease? Is that why we're seeing things differently? Do they respond differently to medications? Or is it all due to the act, lack of access to care, the different treatment options that are ongoing? We need to answer those questions and we need to answer them quickly because if the incidence uh, of diagnosis is way higher now than we, than we thought, then we, uh, we own it to ourselves and to our patients to give them the best uh, that we can with what we have with this disease. Currently, there are no accurate database to look for the true incidence of MS in the African-American population or in the Hispanic population. Most of the data that I've presented here are based on older studies and very small numbers. And the prevalence may be way higher than we are thinking. But we are making decisions every day. We are making decisions every day uh, in terms of how we prescribe, how we treat based on this small number, based on these older studies. So we need to change, we need to encourage participation in clinical trial. We need to assure patients that what happened in the 60s, the 40s is not what's happening today and that we are more vigilant and we are taking more interest and in really uh, assessing better to make sure that everyone get equal access and equal treatment in clinical trials. So how do we improve diversity in clinical trials? Well, it's not from one side. Everyone has to come together to make this change happen. It's a multi-pronged approach. The sponsors who conduct the trial has to be on board. The investigators, so the healthcare provider, they have to be on board. And then also the patients have to be on board with this. And what do I mean by that? So the sponsors who design the trial, they should keep in mind everything I've said before, that the disease is different in this population, that access to care, including time and economics also affect how uh, willing people are to participate in, in trials. And also uh, they have to be flexible in timing in how, uh, what they require of the patients. Because if I'm asking someone to spend two or three hours in the clinic to be evaluated for a trial and I'm taking them away from the work, I have to compensate appropriately and this is what our uh, the next slide talk about. Okay, so uh, first we have to address the bias that occurs in clinical trial. There are implicit bias and there are explicit bias. So implicit bias is looking at the study and the design and it's not fitting to the lifestyle or uh, economic uh, resources for patients of color. The explicit bias is if a provider know they have a study, but they say, you know what? I'm not going to ask this person. Black people don't normally participate in trials, so I'm just not going to bother. And then on the patient end, there's also bias. 
because the patient can say, why are they asking me to participate? Why do they want me to be a guinea pig? I don't want to be experimented on. But while those are valid things and via valid questions, education about clinical trials are also important because if the patient understands the process, if the patient know how they're gonna be monitored, that they are gonna be provided the same as everyone in the trial, and that consent is voluntary, they can always withdraw their consent if they want, that may change the tone of the, concent uh, uh, of the conversation. If they had information on where and how to participate and also the benefits that the community can get from them participating in trial, that can also change the uh, conversation and improve diversity as well. And then lastly, making things accessible as, as I said. If I'm asking someone to commit all this time to the research that is going on, I should compensate appropriately. I should be flexible in the requirements. So what if someone cannot come between eight to 12 or they can come between five to seven? Should we be open to that? That is something that needs to be addressed as well. So that is important. And these are just a few points. This is definitely not a comprehensive approach to improving diversity, but these are the most common things and the easy, easy things to do. Low hanging fruits, as we call it, to be very easy to do in order to improve diversity over time. Speaking of that, for those of you on the call, I would like to point out that uh, a few months back, the National African American MS Registry was founded in, in by a few group of African American uh, physicians in MS and neurologists also taking care of MS. And the goal of this registry is to gather information to start to answer questions that we have and that we talk about. How does the disease affect African-Americans? How, how quickly do they progress? What is their insurance status? So I encourage all of you on here to go to the website and sign up and fill out the survey. The survey is the main thing that we need. The good thing is, is uh, you can stop and come back. You don't have to do it all in one setting, but this is taking the first step to help us answer some of those questions that we need um, to, to help the African-American uh, community. The Hispanic uh, registry is run by doctors. So they, um, uh, they put, information in there by the doctors, but the African-American registry is for patients and we allow patients to put their information in and the information is uh, privacy. We also respect privacy, so it's not something that's given up. And with that, I will stop here and take questions. So I left about 15 minutes for questions and we'll start now. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Okai, for that information. Um, to our listeners, for those who are unaware, there are two ways to ask questions. You can either type them into the chat box or use the raise hand feature in the app. And if you're on a mobile device, you would click the screen and select more, which is the icon with three dots and click raise hand. But if you're on a computer and would like to raise your hand, you can uh, find it in the participants window or turn your camera on and just wave your hand so we can see you. <laughs> um, and while we wait for uh, everyone to find the features, I actually do have a comment. I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a question, but I suppose something can come out of it. Um, it is imperative, of course, that everyone's voices are heard um, as far as you know, healthcare, uh, no matter the race, but it is obvious that the so-called minority groups get disregarded more often than not. Um, I do believe that everybody needs proper healthcare and that it's not always 
us not wanting to go, sometimes you really do need help. And everybody has that right, I believe, to have decent care. <laughs> but I think the there is a misconception of us in terms of how others expect us to behave or who they believe we are based on stereotypical representation and ignorance. Um, but I think that it's, it's, it can be frustrating to be unheeded as a result. And if getting ignored sometimes is the norm, what do you feel is an effective way to address that? Because I see a lot of, a lot of instances where people of color are dying or get sicker than they actually are because they're sitting in an emergency room for hours and they're saying they need help and they just, die or sometimes uh like i saw a video a couple of days back where a young boy i think he was in his 20s and he has brain damage and he has a an allergy to morphine but the doctors kept giving him morphine although his mother told them over and over again that you shouldn't do that and she got frustrated got into an argument with uh an employee and they banned her from the hospital. So I just wonder like, where is the line? How do we address these things without it escalating into, I don't, into- Exactly, okay. I got, I got your point, Kimani. Yeah, it is very frustrating. And, and this is something that's also rooted in um, how, institution and in in the uh, community and that's something that needs to be addressed from all levels uh, from medical school to residency to doctors and if you notice I I mentioned not only the patient need education but the doctors need education as well but what can uh, the patient do to make sure that their voices are heard? Because we keep saying you have to be your own advocate. You have to be your own advocate. So what can the patient do first is, okay, if this is what is happening, and, and this is just a suggestion, it may not be all that it is, but it's a suggestion of what uh, uh, someone can do. If this is what is happening, it's, okay, the, I have given you my complaints and be upfront. I hope you're taking it seriously because I've learned that over time, people aren't hearing what I'm saying. So doctor, do you hear that this, we react differently? And I'm going to the comment in the box because it relates to what you say about African-Americans are less likely to be pre believed when they're in pain. That is really true. I mean, people were, were surveyed doctors and they feel that African-Americans can handle pain way better and refuse to give pain medications because then they will become addicts if they do, when that's not what uh, they look at the Caucasian counterpart. So to be your own advocate is find someone who listens to you. And what do I mean by that? If the doctor you, that you are seeing is not taking you seriously, is not believing you, you have insurance. You are actually paying that doctor. You can go and say, I'm going to get a second opinion from someone else. And what I've found effective is that when you do go and get your second opinion, what, what you start with say, I'm coming to see you because my last doctor did not listen to me, did not take me seriously. And when you start with that, that all that plants a seed in that doctor's head that you know what you're talking about and you want to be taken seriously and be listened to. And even if you have a long relationship to, with the doctor, you have to be upfront. You can say, Dr. X, I have been coming, you, coming to you for this amount of time, but I don't feel that you're really listening to what I, what I am saying. So, and, and there are lots of ways to go about it. There are lots of 
uh, things that you can do, but it's just starting a simple conversation and communication process. For the example that you give in terms of this person receiving medication that they were allergic to, working in the hospital system, I can tell you if I was that mother, my approach would be like, okay, I've told the nurses and the doctors not to do this. So I'm calling the, page, the hospital patient access services or the, every hospital has uh, 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 someone you can call if you're not getting the care. We are from my center is called patient access. And you call or you write a letter, this is what's going on. And in 24 hours, they're supposed to answer you. But most people don't know that, right? If someone had known that, she wouldn't have argued over and over for days with the same person. As you are calling someone, this is not standard of care. I need this to be done. So I think first is starting with a conversation. I need you to listen to me. This is what's going on. And then if that's not the case, then you go up to a higher patient resolution issue in whatever system you are. And as I said, there's not a simple answer to that. It's prevalent. We all experience it. We all experience it even as a doctor. If no one knows I'm a doctor, I get the same treatment until I come out and say this and I say, I know what I'm talking about. So it's being open and saying, no, this is not right. I know what needs to be done. Yeah, I, I would have to agree that there is no other way other than communication, you know, because that's the only way that we can iron these corrugations. Um, I would prefer to call it a come to Jesus meeting because I think that I think that both sides do have biases, as you said, and it would be nice to just come together and put aside differences or whatever. How are you going to help me feel better? I think that's yeah. That's be very blunt and ask the question, Doctor, you are not listening to me. I need you to listen to me. Mm -hmm. And as I said, go for, to get a second opinion go somewhere else if that is the case because you are actually paying that doctor it's your insurance it's your copay yeah mm -hmm. we do have a question from Barbara she asks why African Americans have more disability in the spinal cord for MS so that's one of the questions we need to answer uh, that's, uh, we, we have observed it and we do not have the answer yet. And that brings me back to the clinical trials and information part. Because we do not have a whole lot of information, people aren't participating as much. We cannot answer most of those questions yet. So we do not know, or we know that it has a predilection for the spinal cord but we have to find out more information and that is slow coming at this time. David, I see your hand's been up for a while. So <laughs> I am going to ask you that you unmute yourself and I'll lower your hand and you can speak directly to Dr. Okai. I did it on mute. Is it on mute? We can hear you. Oh, hi. Great. <laughs> Great talk, doctor, and Thank I you. really appreciate it. And the fact is, is that I have been living with the MS now for 24 years. I'm from the Bahamas. My question is, how does one get to be a part of the trials? Because you did say Black people, they don't want to be a guinea pig. I, you know, I don't want to be a guinea pig, but I, I want to learn more about how do I get to be a part of it. Yeah, so I mean, I hear that statement all this, all the, all the time. I don't want yeah, to be a guinea that's pig. Why I laugh. <laughs> that's why I laugh. <laughs> that's why I said that. But actually, yeah. I don't consider it being a guinea pig. I'm, I consider it being on the forefront and the cutting edge you know, and, and then yeah. we're able to answer that. But um, how do you, and, and that's one, you know, 
depending on who your doctor is, if you're seeing an MS specialist, we do a whole lot of clinical trials and I, I actively encourage my patients to look and say, okay, are you open? Are you willing? There are several trials going on. Another way to uh, learn about trials is um, to go to clinicaltrials.gov. But I can tell you, I go to that site a whole lot and it's difficult to, to navigate, it's difficult to manipulate. So what we are trying to do with the National African American Registry is also list MS trials so that um, uh, uh, the participants can know what's available. Because if you don't know, then you're not going to be able to participate, right? So mm -hmm. uh, we're looking at different avenues and, and participation in clinical trials. This talk that I just gave, it has just come to the forefront yeah. two year, uh, for the past two years. But in the works, it has yeah. been going on for five years, 10 years, but the, the uh, visibility just hasn't been up, out there. So we're looking for ways to increase knowledge for, about clinical trials. And those are the three ways I can tell you right now. Yes, thank you. But you see, I'm from the Bahamas. We don't. I don't are know. you in? Are you in the Bahamas? Or I'm in the Bahamas. I oh, live. Okay. I'm from the Bahamas. Okay. And the thing is, is I don't know of any. Oh, I don't okay. Know so of any MS specialist over yes, here? Yes. Yes. I don't know yes. Of any. I have a neurologist. Yes. Like I just went to my neurologist exactly. yesterday. But I don't know about any MS specialist. Yeah, I don't know about any MS specialist in the Bahamas. I think the closest is Puerto Rico <laughs> or, or Miami. Or Miami. So close. So close. So close. My, my, Miami is even closer, right? Yeah, <laughs> Florida yeah, yeah. is even closer. No, I. So, yeah. yeah so then that's a different situation because, yeah. I mean, I, I try to know everyone, you know, even outside of the U.S., but I can uh, bring up anyone in in my uh, mental Rolodex now that's yeah. in Bahamas. Yeah. So yeah, that yeah. will be a little bit difficult for you in terms of trials over there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, well, it is what it is. It is what it is. I hope I, I, I wish I could help you with more yeah. information. <laughs> no, problem. Sorry about no problem, no problem, no problem, no problem. But thanks no for joining today. It's, it's, uh, we appreciate you coming on. I enjoy the, the seminars, teleconferences, Zoom calls that they have, and I enjoy listening, sitting and listening to them. I think this is really? one of the good things about Zoom, Deb and Kimani, yeah. is that you can get people from all over. Yeah, 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 yeah. And give yeah. more information that way. That's how it keeps me on on top and knowing what what what's going on. And so yeah. I, I appreciate it. And so that's... I mean, it's been 24 years, so I mean, I have a long way to go. I have a long way to go, so it's all good. All right. Well, thank you, David. No problem. We have a question in the chat from Teresa. She kind of, yeah, she uh, wants to know what kinds of things that uh, clinic, clinicians and medical providers outside of the Black, Indigenous, and People of Color movement can say or do to show their minority patients that they do care. She says that I see white providers like myself sometimes stumble over their words, and I think it comes from not being sure what to say as if they don't want to point out to the person that they are, you know, minority. She says that some clinicians and providers feel uh, comfortable or should they feel comfortable about being direct about it? And what kind of approach do you think would be a, an effective way? So Teresa is a provider. I'm so glad you're on here today, Teresa. And thanks for that question. I think the first thing, um, the first and foremost is showing your patient that you are human and treating them as human beings. And that's the main thing is uh, showing humanity to someone that they are not just 
another number in your clinic. Um, uh, so that's, that's, that's key. But the other thing is, I, uh, what I'm hearing is that there is some hesitancy and, and discomfort, but it's important to just be open. And I, I say it, and I think you're able to, uh, you can say it as well. Look, patient X, here's what we see in black people. Here is why I am saying this to you. Um, I train under a uh, older white guy. <laughs> so you can't get more neurological than that. But his 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 approach and what I, I think is is one approach that was very uh, effective. He will say, "Let me be blunt." So kind of preparing this and and. Just saying it, um, you know, you don't have to apologize too much or say anything, but this is how it is in, in Black people. And this is why we are treating the way we're, we're treating, or this is why I'm bringing up this clinical trial to you. I think just, just being open and not, and not trying not to offend. Okay, we know what was offensive, but being open and honest to that patient is way more important than trying to make, to circle around the topic because it's still, it's, it's very blatant, you know, if you're white and they're black, it's there. And they want to know that even as a white person, you see them as a human being and you are taking into account that they are different in certain aspect when you're putting their care together. And, and so I will say when you're ready to start the conversation, you can, you can find a phrase that works for you. I said, let me be blunt or let me put it straight or it, it is obvious already, but this is what I'm saying it, but find a phrase that, that will diffuse the situation before. And I say diffuse, but it may not really be diffusing, but, but help open the, the conversation to that patient that you are saying this because, and I hope that helps. Yes. She said it did, and thank you. <laughs> I know you can't see it, but she's sending me direct uh, okay. comment. <laughs> um, well, I don't see anything else in the chat. Oh, Deb. <laughs> Can you unmute yourself, Deb? Yeah. Hi there. So oh, you can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. So when we started to discuss this topic, at the beginning before we even chose speakers or, you know, we, we, we said this is African American month, we want to celebrate it, all this stuff. I was, as a white person, blown away by what I learned from hearing Kamani speak at our meetings. I, I am so disappointed in white people. Like, I, I, I didn't know this existed. I, I didn't know that this bias was here. This is so eye-opening for me. It's like a whole new world. And I, I hate to seem like I'm um, living in a hole somewhere, but I honestly didn't know it existed. And this has really, I'm hoping that everybody that's white listens to this afterwards from the, to the recording, because it's an eye opener. I've, I am, I'm ashamed that I'm a white person and that I didn't know this was happening to minorities. I've, I'm, so, anyway, so I just wanted you to know that as, as my perspective, I am just blown away by this information and I hope it gets better because you certainly deserve it. Why, why are you being treated this way? Why do you have to feel that you're getting inferior care? I don't have to do that when I go into a doctor. You shouldn't have to do that when you go to a doctor if you go for care. So I'm hoping that with time it just changes and, and sooner than later because it's certainly been like this for so long. I, this was an awesome, awesome opportunity to really understand for me as a white person, what everybody else is living with. So thank you. You've been very detailed and anyway, that's what I wanted to say. So. And also, well, can I say something? Um, 
Deborah, that is so correct what you just said. I'm African American, and when I first got diagnosed, the neurologist that I had at the time, she was like, here's a whole bunch of manuals. Go home, pick a medication, come back and let me know. She was going out the country for a couple of weeks. And I was like, wait, wait a minute. You just told me I have multiple sclerosis. So what, well, just read all these manuals. She gave me a, I mean, like every medication at that time in 2014 that was approved for MS. And she wanted me to go on my own. And I was like, stop right now. This is not going to work for me. Either you're going to help me or I have to go to another neurologist. And so I went to another neurologist. And it's unfortunate, and I'm very, I'm educated black woman, engineering, I mean, but they look at us when we walk into the doctor's office and in, in a different lens. And it wasn't until I spoke up, she apologized. And I told her, I thank you for your apology, but I'm going to another neurologist. And I mean, and and Barbara's story is not uncommon. It is so not uncommon. It is, it is sad. And, and Deb, you know, I, uh, thanks for being honest. You've always, <laughs> you've I, I, always I, I, treated me like a human being. Uh, but I, but uh, there, are, there are more horror stories available, but that's, uh, that's not, um, let's not have that negative focus. What we're going to do is how can we address that? How can we advocate for ourselves? Barb, uh, Barbara did the, the step that she taught him when to see someone. But I think if you uh, uh, find someone and you feel that way, first you have to come to Jesus talk with, talk with them and say, this is what I expect. This is what I want uh, with my care. If I, I have patients, so I also uh, ex uh, 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 experience reverse bias as well. You know, I have patients come in and, oh, it's me. And so then, well, can you do this? Can you do that? And I expect this and I expect that. So it goes both ways. Uh, but having starting with an open conversation open and honest conversation i'm coming to you because you are an ms doctor let's say and i expect this care and i hope i can get it here you've already set that ground uh, uh, uh laid that ground work or if you have been seeing someone for a while is okay i've been coming to you for a while but i don't think things are being addressed the way I want it to be addressed, or you are not answering, uh, listening to what I'm telling you, or, you know, just be upfront. Call, call out the, the, the action, call out the situation so that be, they can be aware. Because I can tell you, some, some people may not even be aware that they are that way. And that's the sad part. They may not even be aware that they are. And that's just some, and there are lots of other reasons, but it, it's, it's all, it, it all starts with the conversation. And because things have been so rooted in institutionalism and, and culturally, it's not an easy fix, as I said, but it is the first step. I think and, and just one more thing, Kimani, and we're ta we're s talking about, you know, African Americans, but I must say, and uh, that not every white uh, physician or every white uh, MS specialist is this way. There are a lot of people out there that also take care of of African Americans and know the plight and the causes of that, and they are aware of it and do their best to treat, but we have a whole lot to, a whole lot of ways to go in educating the other half about what this is about and how they can change. I think um, I was reminded of a member of our advisory panel, Deb, when Barbara 
talked about getting papers about multiple sclerosis. There was a young lady, Victoria, who said that when she got her diagnosis, they just gave her a flyer and said, you know, sent her on her way, good luck researching. So that there are a lot of horror stories, as Dr. Okai said, um, with being a Black person with MS and being Black in general. And I think that communication is the only way that it's going to get any better. I feel like we've suffered enough and it's time that we have some open, honest conversation so that it can get better because there is no other way that it can if people don't first acknowledge the fact that they either don't know or the fact that this is a problem. Okay, how can I fix it? How can I fix it so that we can just live together in harmony? So I am glad that we had this conversation and I thank you all for participating. But before I let you go, <laughs> uh, if you did miss any part of this conference, it will be available on demand on our MS Focus SoundCloud page, msfocusradio.org, and on the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation YouTube channel as soon as possible. And please follow MS Focus on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for times and access information. Our next conference will be on Monday, March 1st at 5 p.m. Eastern time with Dr. Amy House, whose topic is surviving suicidal thoughts. And again, thank you all for participating. And Dr. Okai, this was amazing. I enjoyed the presentation and we are so happy to have you always. Thank you. Thank you. And everyone stay well and stay safe.